A's. There's no Macs. There's not even a PC yet. But your task is to write a computer game. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Donna Bailey for the rest of the story. Welcome, Donna Bailey. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. Can you turn this one on? I'm going to take this one. <laughs> Here we go. Is it my hair? Is it my hair? My hair. It like yeah. likes bald people. So you just switch it off, and okay. and if you don't mind, you can just uh -huh. own it. Okay. Okay. Sorry again. Um, let's see. So, thanks so much for having me tonight. And okay. So now I have three things for my hands, and I'll have to get that worked out. But we'll we'll get settled here in a minute. And okay. Um, all right. So here I am in 1982 in a post photograph. Thanks. Um, in a post photograph, and I'm supposed to be portraying working with the VP of engineering at Atari. And I'd like to take you back, way, way back to the very beginning, not because it is so essential to know how things started, but because it wasn't a clear path, it wasn't an obvious path at all that I followed to get to Atari. And I'd like for you to know about it. So I grew up in Little Rock from 1955 to 1972, and I've always been a big reader. That was really my main thing. Um, it was a quiet life in Little Rock. Little Rock was even more quiet back then than it is now. Um, I liked television. I liked music and records. I liked movies, of course, and I liked my dog. I grew up as an only child, and, and I had a dog as a constant companion. Um, and I liked my transistor radio. And when I think about it, my transistor radio that I was deeply attached to was my first handheld device that, that I really loved. And it connected me to an abundant stream of information on AM radio. And I grew up loving KAAY for everybody who's old in the audience. And it's late night original program, Beaker Street, that went on later. But I mean, it went on years later. It continued for years. But um, it started in 1966 as a late night kind of underground music thing. And it gave me the idea that there was a much bigger world that I wasn't able to connect to in Little Rock. And I think that that was maybe the first thing that inspired me to want to go out and be in other places. So then in 1973, for a class at ULR, I got a TI calculator that had a square root function. I needed it for a class that I was taking. And it was also the first handheld device that I had that um, allowed me to input just little lines of programming. It, it just had a really brief programming capacity. And I love that too. And I can't tell you, I mean, it surprised me how much that resonated with me and, and really gave me an interest in things of that sort that I'd never been exposed to at all. So then from 1974 to 1978, um, I was still in Arkansas, and I pursued every opportunity I had to do anything or learn anything about mostly software. I, I was never a hardware person, so I was always interested in programming, and um, I took every opportunity I could and let me show you these pictures a little bit bigger to try to give you an idea of how primitive things were back then. Um, over on the left, there's a punch card machine where you sat and typed punch cards. 
like the card that in beige in the middle, um, everything, if you were lucky enough to be able to find a terminal, everything had the green and white computer paper that I have pictured there. And then the thing that was kind of unusual, I mean, all of these things were unusual, but I was able to find an HP printer that had a um, color printer carousel at the side, and you could program it to pick up the pins and then to draw charts and graphs. And it was so much more awesome than having to do that by hand. So every, every time that I had any chance at all, I looked for ways to learn new skills. And then in um, 1980, or sorry, 1978, I was hired by GM in, in California in a little town called Goleta, which is the next town over from Santa Barbara, California. And I was hired to be an assembly language programmer and only by their goodwill because I had a little bit of Fortran experience, a little bit of SAS programming experience. Um, I had my little bit of HP printer, HP plotter experience, but mostly I did not have any experience, but I lived in the right place and they were seeking people. They wanted younger people to make smaller cars. I'd always driven a smaller car, so they were interested in me from that approach. And they were also interested in the little bit of background that I did have. And they were super willing to teach me 6502 assembly language. And using that, I used binary and hexadecimal. And I learned to read switches and buttons and other input devices from the driver at that point. Um, I mean, car driver, not, not in a computer sense. And I learned to write code for displays and sensors. And it was a really steep learning curve, but I had really good teachers and, and mentors at GM. And they were all patient and, and good, and I learned over time. And just to give you an example, I don't know how many of you are familiar with using binary, a base two system, but that's the system of zeros and ones. And I've shown in an eight bit byte here, um, going up one increment at a time. So you've got zero, one, two in binary, three in binary, that's the 11 looking, um, and so on. And I don't know if you can see this well enough, but it's a hexadecimal conversion table that um, pretty much anyone who was new to using hex had to have some kind of, we didn't have a calculator still. Most people didn't have a, a handheld calculator at their desk. And so we would typically use a, a printed table like this on, on just a piece of kind of heavy paper. And it shows that um, you start at zero and go across the top row um, when you get to 9, you don't change to 10. After that, you change to A through F, and that's the way hex works. And, and so, and then going down that first column, same thing, and then I don't know if you've ever used a table like these. This is a conversion table like people, kids use for um, multiplication when they're learning in third grade or whatever it is. Um, but anyway, this was handy, so. And everybody at GM, we just took it for granted that we used a 6502 reference card. And this one is not exactly like the, the one that I used back then, but I've never been able to find the exact one on the internet like the one I used back then. I certainly don't have the one that I used back then, but um, it just, what was essential about a reference card was that it gave all of the operating instructions, and then it gave the op codes, the, the code for each instruction. And um, this one has a description. I don't think the one that I used has a, had a description. But the C that you see in the, in the detailed um, version is for cycles. So you're always counting your cycle time. And the B is for the number of bytes. And I'll get to that in a minute about how essential knowing the number of bytes and the number of cycles, but usually the shorter supply was the number of bytes. So, and you know, while I was preparing this, I was thinking about which handheld things I was in love with the most during all of this period. And I had this um, Casio clock timer alarm and it played little music compositions 
and it didn't look exactly like this very one, but close enough. Um, this had a little flip top on it and, and with instructions underneath. And I love this thing. And it, it was like so, it just resonated with me so much. And um, my point here is always pay attention to what resonates with you because I feel like the feeling that I had for this turned into my love of, I love my phone, I love my iPod, I love my iPad, I love all of the handheld things that, you know, that we're able to do so much with now. And it, it's the wise person who looks to those past historical resonances and tries to apply them in a, in a present day context. So then in 1980, I played Space Invaders for the first time. I was introduced to Space Invaders and I feel lucky. I was a terrible player. I mean, it was really hard. I don't know. I don't know if this even happens anymore, but when you first, back then, when you first played something, this was kind of a typical reaction for people, but it was hard to even identify what the player was on the screen. Like it, it just, we learned to read games in the same way that we learned to read other kinds of media. Like we read films, we read television, we, we know the tropes of, of television. And I didn't, you know, nobody had any of that experience back then because everything was so new. So I was an awful player the first time I played Space Invaders, but I loved it because I saw that it was really close to what I did at GM every day. And I was able to make that connection between the, the display of Space Invaders. I, I just knew that it was set up and it must be organized and, and maybe it even used the same microprocessor that I used. Maybe it was coded in 6502 also. And from that day on, I was determined to switch. I wanted to, instead of working with cars, I wanted to work with video games. And I thought that my being in that position of using assembly language and making a display that was, you know, even in the ballpark of the display of a video game, I thought that I just took that as a given that it meant that I should set my ambitions on, on being a video game programmer. So I did that. And within, I think, five months after playing Space Invaders for the first time, um, I had tracked down that Atari made video games. I moved, I moved without a job or much of anything else. I moved without friends. I moved without anything, really. I moved to Sunnyvale where Atari was located. And I got myself a headhunter when I first got to Sunnyvale. And she asked, well, you know, what do you want to do? What kinds of things do you want to do? And I said, no, no, no kinds of things. I want to do very one specific thing. I want to work for Atari and I want you to smooth my entry in because um, I was afraid I would screw it up. You know, I was afraid that I wouldn't know how to approach them and that because I understood that it was male dominated. I, I had heard that and um, but I thought that I was in a unique position and I honestly, I mean, my, my thing that I said constantly was I know that I'm not as qualified as the men who work there. And, and I didn't volunteer that until they had pointed that out to me. But as soon as it was pointed out to me, I said, I, I understand that. I know that I'm not as qualified as the men that you typically hire, but I think that I can bring something different to your company. And I would like to try to make a game for you that is somehow different. I, I think that I'll see things through different eyes and, and please consider that. So somehow I, it, it wasn't really an easy hiring process, but somehow I was hired and it was a definite case of be careful what you wish for because, and this was everybody's first day at Atari, here's your cubicle, now make a game for us. Go, get going, what are you going to do today? And it, it was overwhelming. Um, when I started, I didn't have a game idea, so I was behind in that way. A lot of guys came maybe with a game that they'd already made at home um, on some kind of primitive, like, I won't even try to describe all the primitive setups, but people either had ideas that were, that they had just mapped out on paper, 
or sometimes they had actually pieced together something so that they could make a game. And I want to be clear that I was hired by the arcade division. Um, we called it coin-op, but it, it was only for arcade games. There were other women in the, I didn't even know about the home cartridge division. There were other women who worked in that division, but the two um, departments were kept really separated, very firmly separated. So I didn't really know those. There were two women, and I never met them. So um, anyway, so my task was to make an arcade game. I didn't have a game idea. And I found the idea for Centipede in a notebook that Atari had frequent brainstorming sessions. And they kept a notebook that um, had a bunch of game ideas. And, and when I looked at it, it probably had maybe 40 different game ideas described. And um, the only one that was different, there were a ton of laser games, um, space games, sports games. And there was one game that was different. And it was called Centipede from the very beginning. And it was described as a multi-segmented insect crawls out onto the screen and is shot down by the player. And I was like, that's different that I, I think I could get behind that. And, and one thing that was um, immediately compelling about that was that I could envision it. I really couldn't get into the laser games enough to think, what does that mean? You know, um, it didn't, none of the sentences about any of the other games meant anything to me. They didn't make an image in my head, but, but this did, it made an image and, and I thought this is it. So, so at that point, I didn't know how much I didn't know, but I started to find out. And maybe the second day, it, it took a while. I, I won't say that it was the second day. But it, I think it was maybe 10 days before I picked the idea in the game notebook. And there was a lot of, you know, breathing down my neck going on to try to get me going. But um, when I finally picked the game idea, then the next thing was, well, you're going to be in lab one. We've got your setup all ready to go. And what you need to do is create the graphics, begin the animation, set up the interrupt routines, set the data, data structures, use schematics to understand our in-house um, sound chip. It was a custom made sound chip called the Pokey chip. Um, and use schematics to understand how the player controls work. And you need to get all of that done as soon as possible. And that was really overwhelming because I didn't know how to do any of those things. And, and I'd really counted on, since I'd spent two years as a 6502 programmer, I'd really counted on a lot of that understanding transferring over into this new situation. But, you know, suddenly there were all these new words that, um, I should say that at GM, I had worked in a large team, and, and each of the programmers was given a described, you know, a description of a module that we needed to make, and we were told what the module needed to do, the functions it needed to do. We wrote the code, we wrote a test, um, you know, pattern test routine for it, and then we went to the car, to the demo car, and we tested all of our code and in a group, and everybody made notes about what needed to be done for the next day, and then we went back and did it again, and we did that over and over. This was just, you know, here you are by yourself, you're supposed to do all of this, and, and it was hard. <laughs> um, so, my solution for that was I asked a billion questions. I was a question machine. I, if anybody even brushed a gaze past me, I would grab on and ask 10 or 15 questions before they could get away from me. Um, I cultivated friendships. I looked for things that I did know how to do. If somebody wasn't good at something, I tried to see if maybe I knew how to do it. I, I just tried to fit in as much as I could and, and to get that going. I avoided people who instantly made it clear that they wanted to be enemies, that they 
you know, anyone who unfurled a schematic and said the answers are all right here and I don't know why you don't understand how to get the answers from this and I don't have time for this, that person I just thought, <laughs> I'm done, I, no more, that person will not be helpful for me. So I really, you know, made categories of people during that time that people who seemed willing to help, people who were going to be mean to me, I mean, that's how I viewed it. Um, and I, you know, I, I did my best. So over time, here's what I learned to use. And, and, and this part, I've never given a talk that's anything like this. Um, I tried to be more technical because this is coded and I wanted to, you know, go to the technical side. So, but I also have to point out that it was 35 years ago. So, um, but I really, I explored my memories and, and I'm kind of surprised at how much I remembered. So over time, here's some of what I pieced together. So I don't know how, how well you can see this and is it is the contrast good enough? Um, if we want to start with the display features for the centipede board, um, I had a raster display. That means it's pixel based and it, this part that may not show very well is like a piece of graph paper and then I've kind of indicated where the screen is on the imaginary piece of graph paper. And so all of the addressing was as if um, the, the monitor that we used in the games at that point, um, it was like a, a TV monitor, a cathode ray TV screen turned on its side. You know, a TV is usually um, the landscape, but this was like the portrait when it was flipped over. And the way that uh, the old style of TV worked is uh, an electron beam scanning across the screen from the top down to the bottom and then back up to the top and over and over again, painting the picture in pixels. And the size of the screen that, that I had to use, that I was able to use um, for Centipede was 240 by 256 and there were non-display areas on all the edges that I could use kind of as a staging place so that I could get things ready to go, line them up on the side and get ready to send them in, like kind of like a stage or an army or something. Um, and if you think about 240 by 256 and that was supposed to be, you know, really high resolution at that point and, but you know, for the, the size of the screen, those are some pretty massive pixels these days. But And the display rate is 24 frames per second. If you think of it in that way of, um, you know, film is 28 frames per second and, and a TV's rate is 24 frames per second. And so 24 times you're painting a picture on the screen per second. That was a good enough way to think of it. Um, the Centipede board was a really stable board for Atari. It had been used in other games before. It had most often been used as a black and white board prior to that year to 1980. Um, we started off with a black and white board and I being a big display person and you know that was where I thought I could bring the most value. I wanted to make sure that we were able to use a color display and um, but they both worked in similar ways just I ended up with color because I kept insisting on it so but color was more expensive of course and you know the whole name of the game was to keep costs down and keep playing time down so that the uh, operators, the arcade operators who bought the game could be assured that people would want to play it and also that people wouldn't be able to play it for too long and that they'd want to put another quarter into it because it was so fun to play. So tall order, but anyway. Um, so one of the really cool things about what the engineers at Atari had done when they made this board is that they had made 16 motion objects, which I always thought of as little pieces of video that were able to be maneuvered around the screen. So you could have 16 motion objects, 16 pieces of video operating on the screen at any one time. And um, 
The motion objects were 16 pixels by 8 pixels in size. And for example, the player, who somebody was asking me, what is the player? And, and I thought the player was like a snake head when I, when I coded it into the graphics. But the player is a motion object. The shot that the player spits out or shoots out is a motion object. The centipede segments are motion objects, and the spider was a motion object. Um, I also had a full screen full of bitmap stamps. The stamps were eight pixels by eight pixels in size, and they could be placed in eight by eight rows and columns so that um, the motion objects could go to each pixel each each area of the screen, but the stamps had to be laid out in the eight by eight rows and columns. And examples of what were bitmap stamps, the mushrooms were all bitmap stamps. Um, the digits of the score that were written were bitmap were stamps, and the extra lives, the icons for extra lives were stamps. Now, can you see this enough? Um, the really important thing is understanding how the interrupts hook up from the processor to the screen. Um, that was an essential part of understanding what I would be able to do for, for programming. Um, there were three minor interrupts, and those were the short horizontal interrupts. And I guess in TV vocabulary, you call it the H blank, and then there was one major interrupt at the bottom, I've indicated that thicker line at the bottom, and that was for the longer vertical um, interrupt. And in TV language, that I think is called the V blank. I don't know if we have any TV people here, but um, so um, three short interrupts, then one longer interrupt, and total of four interrupts that are queued up with the processor so that. Um, the code needs to all be organized to work around those interrupts to display things on the screen. In the minor interrupts, if the game was in a tracked mode, and everybody knows the tracked mode, right? Um, it's when the game, it looks like it's playing itself and it's meant to appeal to the coin bearer to come over and, and drop the coin in and start the game. So if the game was in a tracked mode, the programmer needed to check for a quarter drop into the coin mech at any time and check for the buttons for the number of players. You could have one player or two players, and, and that was indicated by the player pushing a button. And so it's really essential to watch for that at all times and not miss it if somebody puts a coin in because then they're going to feel cheated and they're going to be angry. So that went into the minor interrupt routine. It was always, you know, constant vigilance of, of always um, watching for those things. Then for the minor interrupts, if the game was already in gameplay mode, um, it's really essential to not miss the player firing the button because, again, the player's going to feel cheated and, and be mad at the game and not like it anymore and not play it again. And it's also essential to get every nuance of the player controls. So again, that had to be in the minor interrupt routine. Um, that's the short one. And um, if a programmer ran over in time, um, the the result of that, if 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 I if I overran the one of the minor interrupts, the the frequent result, the problem with that was tearing on the screen. I don't know if you've seen video tearing, but it's ugly and, and bad. So um, during the major interrupt, so it started at the bottom and moved back up to the top, and you got all that precious time of, of the movement from, from the bottom to the top and that top edge that didn't show. Um, so that gave more time. And during that time, um, I could animate the display the motion objects, um, and by that I mean like the spider's legs could move, so I would move between one graphic picture and another and, and make the, the character animated. Um, I could move the motion object itself, 
So the centipede could go across the screen. Um, I could update the bitmap stamps. Um, the mushrooms ended up being shootable and, and there were different displays for how many times you had shot a mushroom. So I could go through and update all of that. Um, I could update the pokey tip, the, the sound routine. Look for collision detection and, and respond to the collision. Do the scoring, track, the, track and execute the waves or the levels that the player was on. And there's probably more stuff, but you get the idea that um, this was all I could remember when I was trying to make this list. And um, you get the idea that all the big work went on in the major interrupt. And the result of running over the major interrupt was tearing and also bogging down. So you could have like this, you know, screen could slow down and the sounds could slow down to whoa, 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 kind of. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but that's that's really ugly too, and nobody wants to go through that. Um, and and tearing would also be a, a byproduct of that sometimes. So so you could have tearing and slowing down both on the screen at the same time. Now, when I first was learning about what I had available to work with, um, Centipede was programmed in 8K. And I don't know if you look at file sizes now, but you can't save a you know, one-page letter in Word in 8K. I mean, it, it's just impossible. So um, at the beginning, it sounded like so much. And then pretty soon, I realized it was so little. And, and it, they were desperate times at the end. I, I can only tell you about kind of sweating blood, trying to fit everything that had to be done by the end. Um, 8K is 1,024, that's one byte, I mean 1K, um, times 8 is 8,192 bytes. So it sounded like, a, you know, so much, but, but then wasn't. So, um, and in that 8K of code, what I wanted to do, here's the part that I was really eager and, and looking forward to do. I loved making the characters and doing the graphics and stuff. And I loved animating the characters. And my idea was making like a really cool little movie or little cartoon kind of thing. But pretty soon I found out that all of the things that I was supposed to do such as the attract mode, the one-player game mode, the two-player game mode, the self-test for the hardware, the protections against reverse engineering, the copyright info embedded in the code, the scoring calculations and displays, the coin mechanism, the coin mech features, the on-screen instructions, the high score table feature, the cocktail table mode where the second player sits across from the first player, so everything has to be upside down for that. <laughs> uh, um, the extra lives, the levels, the waves, the increasing difficulty, the ramping up of everything. And I, I'm sure I can't remember it all at this point, but, and that was just a nightmare. <laughs> it was, I, I didn't know how to do any of those things. Other people had been through all of that over and over again, so they knew very well how to do those things. Most people, I did make friends, as I said, but a lot of people did not want to share information because it was not to their benefit to share information. My point was always, why on earth do I have to, we have so many good coin mech routines in here that work that have been debugged. Why can't, I mean, make, make that guy give me one. <laughs> that was my approach to supervisors and to management. And they were like, no. We don't give code. <laughs> you know, he he made that, and I can't make him give it to you. And and I just did not understand that. And and my whole thing was, why can't I do what I do best, and not have to learn from scratch the things that I don't know how to do? That we already have code that works, that has been debugged, and and we're scrambling for time and you know, trying to be efficient in, in the cycle time and the bytes, and, and why do I have to do everything? And somehow, at, 
somewhere in that discussion, I was told that um, you need to do all of this because what are you going to do the next time? You're not going to know how to do it the next time either. And and it was somewhere along in there that I realized that, oh, I am probably a short timer. I, I think this is super interesting first time through. And maybe I can imagine doing it one more time, but I'm not this isn't what I want to do for life. <laughs> it, it just had never occurred to me that, you know, that I would do that forever. I, I knew I was still looking for what I wanted to do. And it, it didn't occur to me that most of the guys that I worked with, they were, that was, they were it. If, if they were, if, you know, if, if they went on and if they still worked at their same desk at Atari and they were still making games at the end of their career when they were ready to retire, that was going to be fine with, with many of them. And so that was another difference between us that was really hard to reconcile. So one lesson is that it takes practice to write concise and efficient code. And, and by concise, I mean number of bytes. And by efficient, I mean number of timing cycles. Um, and working there was like the Everest of, of a learning curve. And it was really tough. I mean, every, every single day was really tough. There was a long stretch where I had a headache every day by the end of the day, if not sooner than the end. And, for months, and this was a really hard part. I mean, psychologically, for a, you know, human person, this was a really hard thing. But I coded so much, and I learned so much during the day that I couldn't leave it behind at night. I coded all night long, so I coded all night. <laughs> I got up, I went back, coded all day. You know, rinse, repeat, over and over, and and that's a hard way to live. And and it, you know, I I didn't know how long that would go on, and. And actually, it went on for probably about seven months, it turned out. I mean, just, I, I didn't know when it would end, or if it would end even. So that was hard to wait through. And and I was glad when it was gone. Um, I'll just give you two examples of our really primitive methods that we had back then. Um, when creating the graphics, all of the graphics for Centipede were created. I mean, this was this was the method. Um, they were created on graph paper at my desk. I drew a box that was the size of the motion object, um, eight pixels in height, 16 across. So I drew a box. I colored in with colored pencils that we had in the office. Um, I colored in the character, whatever it was. So, so for the spider, I think that the spider had eight leg positions and his eyes did little things and his mouth did little things and stuff. And um, so all, you know, each of those movements was colored into a little box. Um, and, and each square on the graph paper represented a pixel on the character. And when I got finished, I turned it on its side. And here's an example. So that's one of the and this is just an example. I wish I still had some of the original stuff, but I don't. I just made this. But um, here's one of the spider's leg positions. And here's the representation of the motion object flipped on its side. And then the hex values for each of the rows. And on, on that second row, um, there's the binary and equal to, and you always use a dollar sign for the hex value, so dollar sign 24. So that was one of our primitive methods. And another example is that we, all of our code was handwritten onto the typical green and white computer paper. And then we took our handwritten code on the paper and we put it in an inbox, an in basket, and then there were two women who sat in a room all day and compiled, they typed in and compiled our code and made a prom so that we could take the prom back to the development system in the lab. And so typically when we came in in the morning, we wrote one version and then maybe about 10 o'clock tossed it in the in basket so that it would get compiled and we'd have a new prom. And um, then sometimes we'd time our lunch around, you know, those 
it took about two hours usually the return time for that so we'd go to lunch or whatever and come back and um or we'd stay and play we played a lot um and we pick up our new version and and you know maybe one o'clock in the afternoon and take it to the game development system and plug the new prom in and go through the code for the afternoon and um if we were lucky we could repeat that cycle two and maybe three times a day if we kind of rushed and skipped something but um two two times of that cycle was the usual thing so and then we'd often you know throw it in in the late in the evening and so have a new version when we came in at, at usually 9 or 8 30 or 9 something like that so that's just a you know it was like the rhythm of a day of of tossing the computer paper back and forth writing on the computer paper our handwriting was so much better than i hardly have handwriting at this point i can hardly you know i just type now but um we just didn't have access to anything there was nothing to type and this is an example of a prom a lot of times when i talk to groups um no one knows what a prom is it's a programmable rom and it's a chip and um this is just an example i, I think this is a 6502 microprocessor chip actually but but they all look kind of the same i mean the pinouts were different but um basically this was it so the every programmer learned um where the slot was in the game development system, which looked like a, it, it was like a prototype of an arcade game. Um, it didn't really look any different in any way, but we all learned to, you know, go to the back of the game and, and power it off, take the chip out, um, put the new chip in, power it back on, test the code. And this is a great Atari programmer, Dave Toyer. He made Missile Command. Tempest and iRobot. I don't know if you know those Atari games, but he made the classic arcade versions of all of those. And he, he was a really good programmer and a really good guy, just an excellent temperament and good guy. But he's got a lot of printouts. Um, he'd been there for a long time. Um, over on the right, that whole stack that was probably, I don't know, I think that stack was maybe five feet tall. So he had all of those. And then, I don't know if you can see the detail, um, but behind his head, we had these little cabinets in our cubicle, these little, you know, fold up and down doors. And I don't know why, but we all kept like our special printouts back there. So Dave, Dave has his little special printout place back there, stuff full of printouts. And something else that I always think is funny is that um, people mistake the, that's a poster that he had. People mistake that for like a giant monitor, really cool. But we didn't have any giant monitors. We didn't have any monitors of any sort. That's a, you know, cardboard poster. And his desk has nothing on it except a, you know, punch button phone, if, if you can see that much. So this is the only photograph I know of, of our cubicles, how they looked in 1981. We did not take pictures. Um, you know, it, it was a different time and it just never occurred to anybody to bring in, you know, that we would want to document this. I would give anything if I have so many memories of what it looked like, but no, hard, hardly any photographs. But uh, Do you want to hang with a quick example of 6502 code? Okay. And, and this is just really simplified, but I thought it might be interesting. I don't know. It may be boring. I don't know. And I, I don't usually try to do this, so if, bear with me, though. But um, I thought you might be interested in how an exclusive OR works. That's a, a logic um, calculation. Um, so in video games, Exclusive wars are really useful in all kinds of fields, and um, but the way that we use them in video games is one use is to blink like a light. You can you can blink a lighted area of pixels or blink a stamp on and off, um, and a really simplified example of how how to do that that LDA over there is for loading the A accumulator, 6502 is really simple or simplified um, 
primitive is another word for that. Um, 6502 has one accumulator named A, and then it has two index registers, X and Y. And those are your team players. That's it. That, that's the whole ball game. But um, so this set of instructions is load A with the contents of the example address that I used dollar sign to show you that it's in hex A60C. So you load up the contents. It, it's it's a one byte content value. So you load up the content of that address. Um, then exclusive or it with a mask that you set at one so that you you know what the mask is always you know you know the value of it always and you exclusive or it and then store it back into the same address and the way an exclusive or works is if both bits are the same the result is zero and if the bits are different the result is one so I don't know if that's making sense so far, but let's say the content one at address A60C looks like this, so like a blue light, a blue circle of lighted pixels. And the content zero looks like this, nothing. You see nothing on the background. So if you exclusive or one each time, at a steady rate, the same number of clock cycles throughout the game, so you're always counting maybe like 40 cycles before you want to switch it on and off again. It gives the appearance of a light for one, nothing for zero, a light for one, nothing for zero, a light for one, nothing for zero, over and over again. And it's like the most simple way that you can make something look like it's turning on and off. It's just so three um, instructions, and there you go. Um, let's see. So it was a tough experience, but I'm, I'm really thankful that I had it at that formative time in my life. I was 24 when I started, and that was so hard that it the outcome, and you know, I had no way to predict this, but the outcome is that it made me fearless in every single other thing that I tried to do ever since then, because my thought is always, when I'm taking on something new, my thought is always, well, it can't possibly be as hard as those first days at Atari, and I got through that, and, and you know, maybe I'm even more mature now and, and made of even sterner stuff than I was back then. Um, but on top of that, I'm still I'm I'm so grateful that people still like the game that I made. It's so remarkable to me, and I'm so thankful that that people never get tired of talking about it because I love to talk about it too, and I appreciate your interest and and your attention through all of this. And I'll be happy to answer questions and. If you want to contact me, my email address is a really good way to get me. So, does anybody have any questions? And if yeah, you do have a question. You can come over here, and then that way it's easy for me to get you all the mic. <laughs> so, we're going to form a, a straight line, kindergarten style. Okay, you ready? Yes. Hey, Donna. My name is Tim Freeman. Thanks so much. I loved your story. Thank you. Um, my wife and I are huge fans of the show Halt and Catch Fire. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that or not, I love Halt and Catch Fire. but when I heard that you were coming, I was like, I've got to ask her if she's, if, if that brings back memories for you if, and, and just kind of your thoughts on that and, and how you see the industry today and, and the history in between there. Um, I don't know that much about the industry today. I've been out of it for a long time and I don't really stay in touch with Many of those people, I'm still in touch with a few people, but um, but I love the show Halt and Catch Fire. And one of my proudest moments was at home when the young programmer, the young female programmer Cameron, played Centipede twice in the pilot episode. I was so as, as <laughs> I I hope so, but she inspired me by. You know, it was just, that was just so amazing. And I don't know if anybody knows, I, I thought about trying to, there were a lot of things that I 
thought about trying to cram into this, but Halt and Catch Fire was one of the things that, that I wanted to mention, um, if there was time. Um, that's an actual, it, it's a 6502 instruction, and um, it it's funny because at Atari, we, the, the processor that we used at GM had been modified a little bit, and on our reference card, um, it had the command halt and catch fire, and we were always like, "Oh, don't you know? Don't don't make a mistake and do that. Who would want to halt and catch fire? You know, what does that even mean? Like it's gonna just blow up, or you know?" <laughs> um, I really never got a better explanation of when you would want to do that or what would happen, but you know, we, yeah, we always just thought, "Don't do that." Um, <laughs> it sounds bad. And then at Atari, um, I don't know if I made much of a point about it, but when when I said that at GM I had always had a reference card, and where are your reference cards? And everybody was just like, "Oh my God, she uses a reference card!" And, and so I never, you know, I, I was like, "Fine, I won't use a reference card. I'll invent one. <laughs> I'll start that from scratch too." You know, I, I didn't see that that was so bad that I wanted one. But but since everybody was making fun of it, I I was like, I won't have one, and so I didn't. And I never saw if our processor actually had that instruction in it or not. So, but but the name of the show came from something that was very real. So, and I love that. It's a great show. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you for coming, Donna. Thank but, uh, you. Being one that was uh, totally addicted to Centipede <laughs> for a long time, and I finally got over that. Don't play games anymore. Uh, but uh, I wondered, since it showed up on a lot of other brands, my addiction was on a TRS-80. Uh, oh, right. But yeah. uh, was it, how did it get on other brands? Was Did people copy it? Was it... Was it stolen? Yeah. Was it copyrighted? Help us with that. Um, um, I left Atari in September of 1982, and um, Centipede was not yet a home cartridge game for the Atari system at that point. Um, it, it's a whole long story, um, and and actually, and. I don't know how I made this connection in my head, but I, I didn't make it clear that I didn't write every single line of the code in in the game. Um, and I also um, didn't have every single idea for how to make the gameplay harder. I, I did the beginning things, and and I did most of those completely on my own. And, and sometimes... I had to argue for things that other people didn't think would be a good idea, um, but and it it's hard to know how to say this exactly. But the person who programmed Millipede, I had nothing to do with Millipede, and the person who did intended Millipede to to kill Centipede, the the production of the game. So the the issue of when Centipede went to the home cartridge um, version was all tied up in in whether Millipede was going to be successful and, and whether they were going to continue to build centipedes or anyway it you know there's a lot of politics that don't show outside of the company thank goodness because I, you know I, I didn't like all of that much then and, and I'm not crazy about it now but um, Atari eventually did put out a home cartridge version of Centipede that was as good as it could be because if I thought that programming for the 6502 for arcade games was hard, the programming for the home games was 10 times as hard. I mean, it was it was just, it was really, really brutal. And, and so those guys were amazing at being able to use the display um, in really inventive ways. But Centipede, with its kind of constant reliance on the 16 motion objects, was really hard to convert to a home game. So um, I left way before there were um, home computer versions of games. Um, uh, I don't even know when that 
came around. Um, I can say that, like, I, I don't know if there was an agreement between Atari and whoever published the TSR-80 version. I just, I don't know. Um, but I can say that I went in, um, let's see, in October of 1981, Centipede was released in late May of 1981. And in October of 1981, we went to each year, the, the coin-op department that I worked in went to a coin-op convention, which is so funny because um, what that meant, like in the past before there were video games, it meant that pinball machines that worked with the coin dropping in for payment and laundry machines which worked with the coin dropping in for payment <laughs> and those little kitty rides that used to be in front of grocery stores, they worked with the coin dropping in for payment. And so we were lumped into this convention that was called the coin op convention. It was in Chicago every year right before um, Halloween and um, while we were there in 81, one of the um, administrators or management guys at Atari came over to me and said, there's a guy selling, an Australian guy selling a ripoff of your machine of, of Centipede out of his hotel room and we're going to shut them down <laughs> and you're going to help us. You're going to go to court and testify. And, and so that was like the biggest adventure and really super fun because, you know, I was just standing around on the convention floor and the next thing I knew I was testifying in federal court and we were getting an injunction to, to you know, close down this Australian guy and his partner. And we, and this is so amazing, but the judge went in his robes, he walked down the street to this guy's hotel room and we all crammed into this guy's really tiny little hotel room and we played the game and I pointed out what was similar and how I knew by looking that it didn't just happen by chance that they made a game like that. And the guy, the the judge waited one more day and, and then gave the order for an injunction for that guy to not sell anymore. So, it was so cool, but um, <laughs> but I know from that experience, and you know that was October of 1981, and I know there were plenty of ripoffs, and and the they had not reverse engineered. They they had tried to reverse engineer that copy, but they had not been successful. So they had just reprogrammed the whole thing, and but it was crummy looking, and and so. But I know that there were lots of ripoffs. I mean, that was that was the first one that we went to court about. Um, Atari had a giant legal team that was meant just for doing things like that. So they definitely understood how to protect their investment. So um, it went on and on for years, I know. I'm, that was one of the first um, look and feel court cases, though, that, you know, it looks like it and it feels like it. and and. And can you copy look and feel? Can you copy right look and feel? So, <laughs> long story, but. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned you had 8K to program with. At any point during the game development, were you over 8K and had to scramble around to find the memory? Um, you couldn't, I mean, there wasn't any place to put over 8K, so. Um, but as I was pointing out, you know, I had the things I wanted to do, so I was busy doing those things and then I would get memos, you know, like pretty much daily, you know, oh, you need to do this. And and not being, you know, I, I really only played Space Invaders and I played a little bit of Galaxian and Galaga, which were kind of very similar to each other. Um, that was my whole game playing experience and I was really bad at playing Space Invaders, so I didn't know how much Space Invaders ramped up as you went on. Like, I, I mean, it's so funny to try to convince you of how naive and how inexperienced I was, but, but that's, you know, that was the truth. So, so I was like, oh, because when I had the basic gameplay going and people started thinking it was fun and it, I thought it was really compelling looking and I thought I did such a good job. <laughs> I must be done, you know, and, and then, so I found, you know, that there were just tons of things that I was going to have to find room for. 
So I think the biggest thing that went on during that time about trying to, you know, meet that limitation was that I had drawn a, another character, a grasshopper, that I really wanted to use. And you can see the grasshopper in the self-test, if, if you ever see a centipede in self-test. Um, the character is still, there was plenty of graphic memory. So I, I had that all coded in and I wanted to introduce that character on the screen and there was just no, I mean, there wasn't enough space for everything that had to be there. So that absolutely couldn't happen. So, and then really the last, probably the last two weeks of trying to fit everything in that had to be in was just, you know, me just like, crying blood at my desk, <laughs> just, oh, boo-hoo, you know, this will never be over, and I can't, <laughs> so um, it was really hard at the end. <laughs> hey, Donna, um, Hi. I'm writing a game at the moment, and I've ripped off certain elements, centipede, so I just want to <laughs> <laughs> put that out there. <laughs> um, I'm, I was interested in, uh, if you could talk about the just the development process, how you tested the game, how you found bugs in the game, and how you <laughs> tweaked the gameplay. What was the what was the process for for doing that? Um, funny you should ask because um, you know I I was taught to be a really good tester at at GM, a really methodical and daily tester. Like things didn't go in until they had been tested and and vetted at least. To a certain degree, um, this was a completely different atmosphere. It was just throw it all in, <laughs> hope for the best, see what works. Um, we really had no formal testing procedure. There was one guy who was legendary. Everybody said, "Oh, he can take any game that seems to be working properly and break it." So you know, give it to him, see what he can do. Um, we left. I don't know. I, I think. We left one terrible bug in and probably four more that were not so good. And there were rumors of things that would go wrong sometimes. <laughs> like, and, and those were not even described very well. And so on, on the things that we could, you know, say, oh, I don't think it happened that way. You know, I, I don't think that that's really a problem. That was always our our you know approach to that on the things that were absolutely a problem really bad things um you know sometimes they'd have to send a new um rom to you know all of the arcade owners who had bought a game so mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> really really bad so um i don't think i don't think there was ever anything that was so bad that we had to close the production line though so but, you know, it, it was a lot different back then. I mean, it, pretty much every game had some kind of bug in it. And, you know, and you just feel this deep shame and think, oh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> How could I forget, you know? How could I not know that was going to happen? But, but there was plenty. I mean, it's a miracle any of them ever worked. I mean, it, it was so long ago that the production line was across the street. You know, it was still in California. I mean... Um, I guess it was in maybe 85 when all production started going offshore, but, you know, it was just a completely different time, long time ago, so. What did it feel like when the game got released? And oh, it was great. Um, you know, after months of, like, um, fighting about, I mean, we really fought. I, I, I can't ever be convinced that we were not like fighting for our lives, you know, practically. And um, they were not just little discussions. They were, you know, name calling and, and you know, why'd you make it pink? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're such a girl, <laughs> things like that. Um, and mean, you know, kind of mean. And so after months of, you know, and I still read things, I still read funny things that, um, you know, somebody will say, well, I made a game and, and it was kind of an unusual topic, but if a game about a worm worked, <laughs> you know, 
I mean, I just read that recently while I was preparing stuff. But anyway, um, so after all that time of, you know, a lot of at least quarreling about what was going to go on in, in the game, um, when it was released and it was successful, um, we had a focus group and it, I thought it did really well there. Um, any little thing, somebody would jump on it and say, you know, oh, I told you so, that'll never work. I mean, there were so many things that that, that I just thought, that's got to be good. That's got to be better than not using that. Um, for example, the Pokey had a random number generator or a pseudo random number generator on it. And so I thought it would be really great to use the same number of mushrooms every time, but use the random number generator, the pseudo random number generator, um, to have a different placement of the mushrooms every time. As long as it was always the same number, I just thought, how could that not be better than having the same pattern every time? But there's a lot of quarreling about that. Um, the rapid fire, where you can just keep the button down, um, a lot of people thought, oh no, all of the fun is in slapping the button 10,000 times. Um, and I thought, I am tired already. <laughs> how can it not be better to, how can it not be better to have like that strategy of when do you want to have the button down or when do you want to have it up? So, um, you know, and those were just fierce battles. And, and so seeing that all of that came to an end after it was released, that was just, it was awesome. <laughs> I can't, I can't even say enough about it. That was good. Hi, my name is Vanessa Allison, and thank you for being here tonight and taking time out to, to talk with us. Um, my question to you is, following up on what your last conversation was, you, there's some young women in this room today, and, and I would like to kind of like find out from you what your advice would be to them as they approach this career field, if they choose to go in this career, if they choose not to go in this career, career field and they are a woman in a male dominated environment, how would they navigate that? How do you feel is the best way for them to navigate that roadmap? I was just recently thinking about that same kind of question and um, it would have been so much to my benefit if I could have been better prepared when I started, if I hadn't had the issue of not being as technically experienced as the people I worked with, that would have been so much to my benefit because I wouldn't have had to fight that battle every day. Um, as it was, you know, I was having to learn and, and you know, suffering from that. I mean, maybe suffering is too too much of a word, but, but it, it was a struggle, you know, and, and if I could have avoided that, Part of the struggle, I would have been so much better off. Um, recently, someone was asking me about another female programmer, Carol Shaw, who worked in the home cartridge division and left about the time that I came into Atari. And she left to go to Activision, which had just formed not very long before that, just months before I started in the arcade division. And Carol Shaw, had a completely different experience at Atari than I did. Um, she worked in a different division, and I know there were differences in the two cultures, and so that, I think, accounts for some of her difference in experience. But in her case, she had a bachelor's degree in computer science and then a master's degree in computer science. And so she brought that wealth of, of you know, skill and knowledge into the department that, that she went into at, at our company and she didn't take the constant, you know, you shouldn't be here because several of the guys, there there was the thing of if you were a man with your experience or your inexperience, you wouldn't have been hired. We've turned down men who who didn't have enough experience before and the only reason that you were offered an opportunity is because you're a woman and we don't think that's a good enough reason. And if I could have avoided all of that, I think I would have had a much smoother, you know, we just could have cut those arguments off at, at the base. So 
my first advice is to be really prepared for whatever it is. And, and I don't know exactly how you do that. I mean, I couldn't have done that. I, th there was not the kind of preparation that I needed in the place where I lived here before I went there. And, um, you know, I, I would have had to start from scratch and I know I wouldn't have done that. And so, I, you know, in my case, I, I don't think I could have done any better. I think I did the best I could. Um, but for people who are going forward now, if you can, when I was teaching at UALR, I always try to show my students so many things. And, and in my classes, I often say, you know, if you don't like the work that we're doing today, just hold on because we'll do something completely different tomorrow and maybe you'll like that better. But my point is that I want to show as many things as possible because I want you to constantly be searching for those resonances inside you. Things that you maybe weren't exposed to when you were growing up, things that that you don't even know that you like, things that you don't know exist even. I want to show you as much as I possibly can and, and it's up to each of my students and each person that I try to share this ability with um, to figure out, you know, everybody's different about what they get attached to and what really inspires them and what they want to do and stuff. So the younger you are when you can figure out what you really want to be involved in and then really prepare yourself in a positive way and then head into it and just do your best and, and don't take no for an answer and I don't know really what that means today. Um, I know that during the interview process at Atari, if I had taken the first reluctance and, and negative, you know, skewed in the negative way, if I'd taken that as a no and just gone home and said, they must be right, <laughs> um, it wouldn't have happened. And, and it was completely worth what I put into it. And, and I, I think that they got, you know, a value for for what they put into it too so um so be prepared and then be super stubborn just set your sights and yeah <laughs> sure. hey donna i uh, i want to thank you again for doing thank coda you. tonight with thank us you. i, I want to ask the the last question and kind of a follow-up to this uh there are several students from the arkansas school for math and science here would you would you all raise your hands if you're from asmsa Okay, several. And then if you're an entrepreneur working on a, a startup, raise your hand too. So there's several here. So one of the first things that Governor Hutchinson did when he took office is he mandated this computer science initiative. Uh -huh. There are two or three members of that task force here tonight. So what, what would you say to students that aren't really, they don't know what computer science is. They're in a high school where nobody in their town has a clue what computer programming or computer science is. Why should they take that high school class and why should they explore that? Uh, let's see. Um, it's so obvious to me that um, I don't know how to answer that really. It, I mean, what do we touch that knowing as much as you can about software and hardware, what do we touch each day that, that it's not to our benefit to to learn about hardware and software. I mean, it just and and if you you know if you just expose yourself to just the briefest um, like the Internet of Things, who's interested in that? Um, so, I mean, the more that the more you know the better you're going to be able to work your house if, if for no other reason, you know? <laughs> that's, a that's, that's a phenomenal answer. Yeah. Um, and I thought you were going to go a little bit different direction with that question. And, and what I would say to everyone is to, we are in such an amazing time when there is so much free, um, free browser-based tools for learning things, um, free like W3 schools, W3C schools, W3 schools, yeah, that's it, I think. Um, um, 
we're just in such a time that, that the internet is so helpful to us for providing free tools, free things for us to learn. Um, you can, you know, back when I was learning things, um, I, I think of myself as an autodidact for reading and scholarly pursuits, but you can be an autodidact for learning about, you know, software and hardware and um, you can go to maker spaces and, and you know you can you can have game kits for little bits and um, you can have a 3d printer for what $125 now not a very good one but you know it could be your starter 3d printer um, you can use blender to learn 3d modeling and learn to animate 3d shapes um, all of those things I mean it, if I tried to put together a list of, you know, what you can learn for free today, it's so remarkable. And and so, of course, take advantage of all of those things. And, and when you use a free product, find out what it's similar to that people pay a lot for. Um, Blender is very similar to 3DS Max and, and to, um, oh, sorry, I'll just leave it at 3 No. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'll leave. I'll leave it at 3ds Max because I can't think of, of the of the other. But 3ds Max is plenty expensive, and there's a there's one more that's even more expensive than that. But Blender is free. It's a free download, and and then there's a giant community that helps you learn to navigate it. So take advantage of all of those things. Um, um, and and again, why just seems so obvious to me. And, and even if you don't think you like things like that, and I, I guess everybody here does think that he or she likes things like that, or you wouldn't be here probably, but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, when, when I was growing up in the 20th century, there was kind of one kind of literacy, a reading and writing literacy. But now there are, you know, probably 40 kinds of literacies that, that are easy to define. and and free opportunities for all of those and just dive in. I mean, use all of your spare time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yay. OK, seriously, how fun was that? <laughs> Who is going to go home and Google Centipede so you can play it on, on an emulator? <laughs> yeah. OK. A um, couple of quick things. We, again, we do this every fourth. Tuesday, different topic every time. And um, the next one that we're going to do in October is, I might get this wrong so somebody can correct me, but five no SQL languages. Is that right? Okay. Woo. I got it right. I am not a technical person, <laughs> just so you know. Um, now I am because I said that. Okay. So, and then up at the front, we have a fun little selfie station where you can take a picture and post it online. We've got our Twitter handle hashtags up there as well as Donna's. So I encourage you to please go take a picture. Maybe Donna will let you take a picture with her. I don't know. You'll have to ask. And uh, post it. And then come back and see us again. All right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.